Welcome to Kyperian Commentary. This is episode 98. I'm your host, Yuri Brito. The Reverend Dr. Greg Strawbridge uh, died a couple of weeks ago. Now, those of us who knew him well, we have mourned uh, profusely these last 14 days. We've lost a friend, a mentor, and a titan of the Christian faith. His presence in the CREC was palpable every time we met. He was kind, gracious, studious, a Presbyterian of high caliber, a churchman with unspeakable talent, a pastor with theological and pastoral inclinations, which made him a remarkable gem in every way. When we were in Lancaster, Pennsylvania last week, we had the opportunity to gather, to remember and to grieve and laugh over Greg's stories. And uh, it was a really remarkable time. A very gracious host provided the uh, second floor for us to meet, filled with several of the finest beer taps in Pennsylvania. And what we did is a group of pastors gathered and we told stories and rejoiced in the life of our brother. And on this episode, I thought I would bring some of the men who were trained directly by Greg Strawbridge to join me for this episode and do a bit of a, an imitation of that evening, which cannot be imitated, but at least an attempt, a bit of the storytelling bit from the perspective of folks who spent enormous time with him and who now shepherd their own flocks as a result of um, what I think Jared McNabb called the Greg Strawbridge School of, of Theology. So uh, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It's good to have you guys with me here. What I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to introduce myself. My audience knows who I am, but I'm Pastor Yuri Brito in the CREC pastor here in Pensacola. For This is my 14th year, actually. It's been a long time. Uh, I'm now one of the veterans in the CREC, 14th year. And uh, let me start with John. Introduce yourself briefly, John, where you pastor, how long you've been there, a little bit of that. And then we'll go to Jared and then to Mike. Sure. So uh, my name is John Herr. I was born and raised in Lancaster, actually, but not in the Reformed world. Uh, made my way over to All Saints under Greg uh, after Bible college, after uh, becoming uh, Reformed during Bible college and, and uh, ending up there. Uh, I was there at All Saints for eight years, after which time I came here to Chicago and now pastor at Christ Covenant Church of Chicago. And I'm coming on uh, five years now. So wow. it's been, that's gone quickly. <laughs> Fantastic. Jared. Yeah, my name is Jared McNabb. I pastor um, Christ Church in Morgantown in Morgantown, West Virginia. Um, I've only been here for about six months now. I was at an independent church for uh, five years. I uh, found All Saints in 2006, 2007, uh, actually Palm Sunday, 2007. I was a, a sophomore in Bible college, a Dave Calvinist, and uh, someone told me, hey, go to this church. It'll have everything you desire. And so I went there and stayed around for about 10 years till I took a call. Yeah, fantastic. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, my name is Mike Shover. I'm the pastor of Christ the Redeemer Church in Pella, Iowa, CREC. Uh, I had come to, uh, I, did not, I did not spend as much time at All Saints as, uh, as these two gentlemen did. John, her, and I actually uh, went to college together at uh, PBU, Philadelphia Biblical University. So him and I were classmates, and uh, we uh, cut our teeth into reform theology underneath the teaching of uh, Eddie Field, who is now a CREC pastor in South Carolina. And, uh, and so during our journey there, uh, uh, we ended up at Lancaster together. Uh, but John and Jared, they, they had got there before I did. I had already finished my course in seminary, and, and it took me a while to get there. And, and uh, I, I didn't stay there that long. I was only, I was only lived there for two and a half years or so. And, um, and then was quickly uh, swept away to plant a church in Fairbanks, Alaska, uh, under the leadership of Jack Phelps. And then, uh, and then when my time was there coming to an end, I sent out my resume and got picked up here in Pella, Iowa. And so now I've been here for uh, uh, just three, over three and a half years now. Okay, wonderful. And we're all CREC ministers, um, the Community Reform and evangelical churches. So if you find yourself in Chicago, Morgantown, or Pella, I can uh, attest to the uh, faithfulness of these men as godly shepherds and, uh, and ministers of the gospel. I want to see if I can pull up this glorious picture that uh, Ned Buster put together for the funeral, Greg Strawbridge. And I just want to 
talk about it a bit. Can you guys see that? Yep. yep. Um, I want to, this picture incorporates and embodies everything that uh, Greg Strawbridge was and will be for us for years, years to come in our pastoral work. Um, John, let me start with you, John. Um, make a couple of observations here about this picture, what you see. And uh, I, I want our, our audience at Kyperian to get a, a feel for the grandeur and the happy generalism of Greg Strawbridge. And I think this picture encapsulates so much of it. And you guys can just jump in here. I'll start with John and just fill in the gaps for some of the things here about uh, Greg Strawbridge. Yeah, um, well, there's a, there's a really great, um, I was gonna see if I could find it quickly, but I wasn't able to. There was a great description that also came on the bulletin um, that, the, that the artist put together with um, Bible references for a number of these things too. Right. So if you have that, Yuri, maybe that'd be great to put up as well. But yeah. these are things that, um, that many of us who knew him can, uh, can readily see his love for these various items. Um, just to pick a couple, I guess, uh, there's a, of course, the most prominent thing aside from the sola gratia is the, the guitar. Uh, Greg would play, um, would play blues and old rock and roll at, at many of our fellowship meals. Um, very often, <clears throat> very often he would, uh, as part of the set, he would say, no, everyone please stand for the national anthem, at which point he would uh, launch into Sweet Home Alabama. Um, Turn it up. <laughs> was, was this in, was, John, was this in the fellowship meal like on a, on a Sunday morning during the week, a little gathering or all the above? All of the above. All, all the above. <laughs> Typic, typically, it'd be a, a Sunday afternoon after church. We'd get, we'd be maybe at a at a farm. One of the one of the families had a farm, and uh, we'd lovely. just be out in the grass, plugged in with a whole bunch of extension cords, and um, he'd be he'd be rocking it. So, yeah, that that guitar was a big thing. Um, uh, that guitar, actually, the the one that one's based on, is hanging in his house right now. It was over there on yeah. on Tuesday, and that was hanging there. So. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. A couple other things. The uh, just just above the, I can't really point on here that anyone would see it, but just over the kind of the left hand part of the guitar, there's some hops. Uh, man loved a hoppy beer. Uh, there's a there's a, a wedding ring up in the top left, uh, obviously mm -hmm. re related to his uh, wife Sharon, and I I believe the the two threes indicate how long they were married. Yeah. Um, and I'll just do one other. One other. There's the the poppy flower. Uh, his his granddaughter Marlo called him Poppy. Aww. Oh, is that what that was? I was thinking that that was like uh, the like the, the the Lutheran rose thing, and I got really confused. I'm like, he wasn't Lutheran. I'm like, what is going on there? And then that I was thinking, oh, maybe like it was that. like a four leaf clover because he was Irish. Like, I I had no idea what that was. <laughs> that that now makes much more sense. <laughs> Jump well, in, guys. I want to, you know, point out the uh, communion cup in the uh, top right with the <laughs> AS for All Saints, where Greg mm -hmm. pastored for 21 years. You know, we had they actually uh, have a common cup at that church, so we walk. They would walk forward for communion, uh, receive communion at the rail, and they would come around with a common cup and also a tray of the, you know, the individual ones. But um, yeah, so I mean. That, that speaks to Greg's faithful word and sacrament ministry for 21 years there. Uh, the other thing that I love is the jar of pickles down in the bottom right. right Greg got really into uh, fermentation. I think it probably came from, we had a couple uh, guys join All Saints out of the Amish community. Yeah. Uh, so some of these guys were really into fermentation and pickling and uh, I believe one year for Lent, Greg made uh, sauerkraut that he wanted to age and let ferment for, for Lent and then eat it on uh, Easter. Well, that blossomed into what he called pastor's pickles. So every <laughs> fellowship meal, there would be huge <laughs> jars of pickles and other fermented foods. And some of them would be hot and spicy and other ones, you know, sweet and just plain dill and I mean, all sorts of stuff. You never know what you're going to find in a pastor's pickle jar. Were the pickles great? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Indeed, every time, every time uh, I'd go to Greg's house, uh, he'd open up his fridge. Hey, you want to try some pickles, or you know, or, or he'd have some peppers or something, you know. And he'd, he'd always have he'd always have something pickled and ready to serve up. 
he loved it. Uh, I wanted to point out, um, uh, well, so down in the in the right hand corner on the, the the side of the the guitar there, yep, right where you're pointing the anchor. So uh, uh, Greg had a sailboat and uh, and and he would take it out into the Chesapeake and and a lot of people have so many wild stories there. Um, I'm sure John can tell one about his broken knee and swimming in the Chesapeake behind the behind the the, the boat there. Um, but he he had a, he had a love for sailing, and uh, I remember I would I would talk to him often. I said, you know, Greg, I would sure love to buy that boat off you. And his eyes would get all big and like, yeah, well, you know, I'm not using it much right now. And then, of course, he was, but he was just so kind. Um, <laughs> and then uh, and then another time. Well, I'll point up to the catfish there in the middle. Um, so another time, one of the, one of the gentlemen from church, uh, Brant Hauser, took us out on a on a deep sea uh, fishing excursion. I guess it wasn't deep sea, but oh, here's a catfish. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> and uh, and and we were we were actually so we weren't we weren't fishing for catfish, Greg. Yeah. Uh, we were fishing for flounder. And, uh, and, and I was, I was like right next to Greg, I was on the aft of the ship and Greg was on the port side, I suppose. And, and, uh, and, and he was, he didn't catch anything all day. And I was pulling them up left and right. I'm catching everybody around us is catching fish. Greg didn't catch a single thing. Well, he was so upset that the next day he went, when he went home, he contacted a man in the church, uh, Paul Nepley, who works at a place called Covance. It's a kind of a animal uh experimentation laboratory where they develop vaccines and things like that but they have these stocked ponds full of full of all <laughs> sorts of fish and one of them is a stocked pond of catfish and you know your catfish are no bigger than you know i mean they're, they're not getting that big but they're, they're maybe about a foot long maybe but they were not big but he just he pulled up a whole bunch and he was so happy that day he just he, <laughs> he, he couldn't he couldn't abide the fact that he didn't catch any fish on the boat so he had to go he had to go to a stocked pond to make sure that he got his fill yeah that's fantastic. Uh, ben just joined us. Ben, uh, in the beginning, we gave a little bit of um, uh, an introduction of where you're pastoring, how long you've been there, and how long you were under the um, Greg Strawberry School of Theology. Can you just introduce yourself for our, our audience here, brother? Ben Russell. I've been here at Trinity Presbyterian Church, CREC, in Valparaiso, Florida, for almost 10 years. This coming month will be 10 years we've been here. And uh, I, Greg, let's see, I'm thinking 09, I met Greg in 2009. And um, pretty shortly, we, con we contacted Greg with the intention, myself and a guy named Kevin Flofligan and another guy named Peter Anselmo. We contacted Greg back then with the audacious request that he train us pastorally for ministry and church planning in 09 and I kind of cold called him and so he we we all of us wanted to kind of to go to experience the gray friars um training program but we, none of us were in the position where we could relocate to the West Coast or whatever that, whatever you call that, Idaho. And so uh, we said, how come there's not a Greyfriars East? And Greg said, well, I, we've, we've done kind of ministerial training over here and I'd be happy to do that with you guys. So we did that for several years and um, he ended up sponsoring us to do church planning work in kind of the mid or western uh, Maryland area for a while and uh, that's how I got to know him and train under him and value him as a spiritual father like these these guys and a uh, friend what what do you see in this uh, in this photo here from uh, Ned Buster that kind of uh, resonates with you Well, sheesh, I'm sorry to join late. Um, a lot of it does. I mean, I, I, I got some of the, so let's see, what, what hasn't been talked about? 
<laughs> yeah. And why don't you talk about the, the utensils in the top left, perhaps? <laughs> okay, so I can't I can't quite make out what's that. Is that a 33? Is that a ring? Yes. I don't I don't know what that's about. I think it's their the how long they've been married, 33 years. Oh, I see. Beautiful. I got it. Um, yeah, so I, thanks, John. That's, that's a good, Jared, were you, you were there in 09, right, Jared, yes, for I that, was. for the cook-off? Yep. yep. Okay, so Greg, I, I mean, I'm sure this has been brought up. Greg was a foodie, um, <laughs> and that was, but that's a, a big part of his ministry. I mean, like, you think about Father Robert Kaplan and yeah. some of some of that kind of approach to ministry and i've seen that lived out in certain um uh what's his name father kennedy who's uh, an rec guy i don't know if you guys know him i got to be at a wedding that he did and it was like it was like watching him he literally had his his full uh, he had a shirt with a collar and he was and he rolled up his sleeves and he smoked like a side of beef and prepared it the day of the wedding or the day before the wedding. And um, Greg was like that. Greg used his love of all things culinary for just, just this, it was like an overflow of, of gospel ministry. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we called, I called, called, cold called Greg because this other guy I knew, Kevin, mm -hmm. Bothlegan, who had ministerial aspirations and um, theological training and who wanted to get in and pursue the ministry and it was kind of flirting with CREC or something like that. He cold called Greg from uh, wordmp3.com. I'll maybe get into that later, but um, so he told me, yeah, you should do it. Just call up Greg. I mean, I'm thinking there's no way he's going to pick up the phone. And he did. And um <laughs> So I, he met me at a restaurant and brewery up in Lancaster. What was it called? The Iron Horse or something like that? What Iron Was there Hill, a place probably. up there by the college? You guys remember? Iron Hill. Iron Hill. And then afterward, he said, well, you should come up and meet our church and you should bring some of these other young guys. So He's like, it, you know, in fact, the perfect thing is we've got this big festival coming up. And I don't remember which which festival it was because they did several of these. And anyway, um, Randy Booth was coming up. And so Randy wrote a tribute and he talked about the first time he visited Lancaster. They organized this great fun festival and it was related to All Saints Day or I don't know, uh, maybe St. George Day or something like that. And um Greg and Andy, so uh, I'm sorry, Greg and, and Randy, Randy was doing training, ministerial training and ministry that week, but they organized a kind of an Iron Chef cook-off between Randy, <laughs> who loves culinary things, and right, Greg. Right. And <clears throat> Jared, were you in charge of, of picking the judges? Yeah, so Greg, you know, so we had to pick judges. What was it? Uh, hamburger and apple pie. I think it was actually <laughs> July 4th is what it was. That was okay. So it was July fourth. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Uh, Greg was very particular yeah. about impartial judges. I had two <laughs> guys at church, and Greg like, no, like they would just pick Randy just to just to spite me. Like they need to be impartial. So I said, hey, we got two new guys here. Yeah. So Peter Anselmo, who's now a, an elder in uh, West Virginia at a CREC church, um, he. He had never met Greg before. And I had only met him once or you know twice in person. And so we're the newbies and Greg invites us up for this. And so we're thinking this will be a great opportunity to meet some people. And we're thrust in the middle of this intense, like Randy is in it to win it. And Greg is in it to win it. And they've been talking smack about whose barbecue is better because Greg has just invested you know, a second mortgage into this big green egg <laughs> yes, contraption, right? Egg. And so they've been escalating and now it's like this big UFC thing where they've been talking smack this whole time. And, and the contest becomes not just cooking like the world's greatest hamburger, but then 
I, I'm so good with my grill. I could cook an apple pie in my grill. So it's become this, okay, contest is a hamburger and an apple pie in a grill. No other, like, no oven, no nothing. So we, we get to be the judges for this. Like, hey, welcome. Let's meet everybody. Oh, by the way, you are going to have to choose between Randy Booth and Greg Strawbridge. So that was a, it was a fun day. And as I recall, I, in fact, I just found this video the other day. Uh, we chose Randy's hamburger, kind of edged out Greg's. So we awarded him the, the prize for that. And then we awarded uh, Greg really pulled out all the stops and he made a, the rules were they had, I think they had to use the same crust and it was like a store-bought crust. And then they had to use the same apples, locally grown apples. And so Randy just doused his in brandy. <laughs> <laughs> just like, hey, that's going to be awesome, right? It's going to taste great. But Go Greg, wrong. Greg threw in mangoes and then topped it with cheddar cheese. Huh. And I thought, this is crazy. Who does that? Who puts cheddar cheese on top of an apple pie? And it just, it was amazing. And so we gave Greg the, uh, the award. The award. And, I, and I, when I was looking, it was so cute. I watched the video again. And when we announced, we like each judge announced, like you had to give points for creativity, points for taste and all this stuff. And when the last person, probably Peter Anselmo was the last judge, when he, it was clear that Greg was going to win in the background, you can see joy. And she's just a little girl and she's like so excited for her dad. And when she realizes her dad is going to beat Randy Booth, she does this fist pump and in the background. It was so beautiful. That's great. That's uh, absolutely terrific. So a couple more things here that the, you guys can pull out. This, of course, is the what's the technical term for this? A baptismal I think it's a shell. Baptismal shell. Yeah, I think that's what it's but, probably called. But I don't think, I, I've never seen Greg use the shell. Have <laughs> any of you? No. It'd be yeah. kind of weird if there was just a disembodied hand there, though. Right, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> like Veggie Tales, like, ah, oh, the hand. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a classic, uh, you know, uh, baptismal uh, instrument here. And you have the, um, let's see, anything else you guys see there that's unique? Well, of course, right above the shell is the Word MP3 logo. Word MP3 logo, which we're yes. all very uh, yeah. familiar with. Yep. Many, many people came to, uh, <laughs> came to uh, understand baptism <laughs> through Greg's Word MP3 ministry, <laughs> uh, came to a reformed understanding of, the, of that. So, I knew a lot of things about Greg, but the ink pen, that was new to me. That was actually new to me, too. I don't know if anyone else knew that he was into that Probably well yeah what, uh, explain that to me i don't i don't understand that because greg's handwriting was horrible <laughs> <laughs> he would he greg, greg would just greg, assume that was his writing oh i i, I guess it, i guess it's just his i guess it's just sim, a sim, yeah a symbol of his writing but his literal handwriting was atrocious he would yeah. he would he would be so kind as to as for everyone's birthday uh, he would he would write a, a quick little birthday card for people and you, you could barely even read it. Um, but he would give birthday cards to people uh, whenever it was their birthday that that Sunday. Okay. And uh, man, you could barely read it. That's lovely. Well, someone told me uh, that he liked to write some letters on with ink pad, which is a hmm. with with ink. Uh, let's see here. This, of course, symbolizes a little the little headset. Um, I don't know how it was with you guys, but every time he and I talked, he always had this, some Bluetooth device and his voice was always <laughs> muffled. And I'm like, man, I can't barely hear you, man. And, uh, but it's funny how, how technologically hip he was for a man in his fifties. I love that about him. <laughs> Let's well, that see. that yeah. probably points it's, to his recording as well. Yeah. The, he always, recorded a lot always of getting a, there were several times at uh, ETS conferences where this was really great, where he would try to do the uh, like, I, what was it? I view, I the, view, the yep. different worldview yep. uh, interviews. And, um, you know, if he was doing something and working at the table and he looked over and he saw some scholar walk through the door 
there were times where he would just grab a recorder, thrust it into your hands and say, oh, there's like, oh, there's, um, who was the one? Like Dan Wallace. Oh, there's Dan Wallace. Go get an interview with him real quick. Yeah. <laughs> Which is so cool to have the excuse to do. But then when you get up to Dan Wallace, it's terrifying because yeah. you think, what am I going to say? <laughs> well, I remember he had a story about that where he was asking scholars uh, what their favorite, um, you know, translation was. And yeah. uh, N.T. Wright had said, you know, do not read the NIV. Like they don't get Paul right. They don't. It's it just do not use the NIV. Well, then later is uh, Michael Bird. You know, he's a kind of friend of Wright. They were sitting next to each other, and Greg said, you know. Bird, what's your favorite? And Bird said, well, you know, the NIV is pretty, pretty good on Paul. <laughs> and said, well, and she right said opposite. And then Bird trying to backtrack his, his comments, you know, sitting next to the master. And uh, Greg was kind of trying to get them to fight a little bit on his eye view. Yeah. <laughs> Yuri, what's that down at the bottom? Um, is that a... <clears throat> When I was looking at this before, but over top the anchor, um, is that You're, the water? Is that the yeah, flow I, that's coming down from baptism? That's a great question. I'd be curious to see what the um, it, yeah down down a little bit further. you yeah that surrounding the anchor. Yeah, it, that, it, that would make sense it, if it was the water. It's the I, water. You know, you got to start with a few drops up there with the baptism, but then yeah. down below the well, tea. Yeah. It oh, kind of becomes yeah. a river, the river flowing. That's oh, what I took that to be. That's Listen, great. for for those of us who um, love JBJ, we can study this thing for another 10 years, man. Yeah. <laughs> we need this to find the... a heptamorous chiasm in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um... <laughs> write, a whole, right. write a whole thesis out of this, the broken bread here. And uh, anyway, a lot of different things to consider. <laughs> Let me um, get back to us here. Hang on a second. There you go. Um, you know, one of the things that um, I, I want to just uh, just take a little time here and maybe perhaps share um, a, a couple of stories. We shared a lot of stories when we were there in Lancaster together and um, just a couple of meaningful stories, uh, funny, sober, whatever kind of comes to mind. And, um, and we'll go from there. I'll start with you, John. Yeah, well, when we were together last week, uh, I didn't share any there. I was just sitting there listening to everyone else's stories, being um, kind of kind of overwhelmed by the just deluge of of different thoughts I had from from the eight years that I was there. Couldn't really pinpoint anything, um, and I, I still feel the same way. I've got you know I've got stories. I've got little just clips or or you know in my mind of short things that happened. Um, but it, it was, a, it was just a, a ton of stuff. Um, I did, I did think through a little bit. There's two, two that I decided I wanted to pull out here for today. Um, and the first goes back to my, my wife and I, when we were getting married, uh, Greg married us, uh, going on 13 years ago. And this was, you know, within my first year or so at the church. So I was still pretty new, still pretty <laughs> newly out of Bible college. And, um, so we're, we're standing there at the altar and, and Greg's giving his homily. <clears throat> I remember standing there with my back to the congregation and a, a lot of my family members, extended family members, uh, I'll just say we're not, uh, uh, are, are not big fans of, of alcohol. All right. So we're standing there and, and he's talking about John chapter two and the wedding at Cana and making this big build about how Jesus was making the best wine and it was uh it was just flowing forth into the wedding and and then he says jesus was the life of the party um and i remember standing there again like i said with my back to the congregation just kind of wondering what kind of looks were on the faces of the people behind me um and uh hoping that that didn't cause any <laughs> consternation uh but 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 interestingly, I, I you know I didn't realize it then, but that that sort of description or that sort of statement kind of describes Greg's uh, I think his his lived theology and his eschatology, uh, the the goodness of those created things and uh, the blessing that it is for us to take joy and to 
um, to experience the things that God made uh, was was really an, uh, an important part of his of his work and life. And so the second the second story kind of connects to that, but is more recent. <clears throat> I wasn't there for this, and so I hope these details are right. My wife was there, and, and a couple of my kids. But um, at at uh, Greg's uh, Greg's daughter Jenna, her wedding uh, was being held in the backyard of a of a friend of ours. Uh, the, this backyard kind of butts up to a, a stream or, or a creek in Lancaster County. And they had their wedding there. They had the, the reception was going on. I think Greg had cooked some food for it. Uh, they had some beer. They had, you know, just a, a big party going on in the yard. And at some point during the reception, a couple of kayakers are floating down the stream. And um, somehow or other, Greg got it into his mind to just walk down and invite these kayakers, these random kayakers off the stream to come up and have a beer with them, have some food and join the party. Um, I, you know, I don't know if it was, if it was my wedding, if I'd have been crazy about that idea, but nonetheless, that, I think that shows just, again, his, his desire to be like Christ and be the life of the party, right? To, to invite people in and to share with them. Um, and I think though, though those are just two really short snapshots, I think those things could be, you could find echoes of that throughout, throughout his life, I think. That's lovely, brother. Uh, Jared, you shared um, a really a powerful eulogy at the at the memorial service. You can uh, relay some of that, or, or if you have some new stories, I'm sure y'all have plenty in your Greg Strawbridge Reservoir. Feel free. Yeah, um, you know some of the ones that I shared, just kind of short ones. You know, there was a time where we were getting together with some uh, uh, sovereign grace pastors. So you know, these guys would be on our, on our side and soteriology, but a lot of worship and other issues, there'd be significant differences. And uh, Greg had fellowship with them a few years before and then he, he had them over to his house, of course, smoked a great brisket, but solemnly warned us that we were not to debate that day. We were to learn and we were to fellowship, but not debate. I think he was actually really pointing at Michael Shover when he said that, but- What? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the one, the one that story sounds right. <laughs> you know, the one story you guys know, but but there's an ending that I don't know many people know. I don't think I've shared this, you know, and that's uh council 2008 where the uh the infamous uh Stephen Wedgworth um uh, questioning examination, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the 2008, I asked Greg if I could intern with him, and he said. You know, I had to do an internship for college, and he said, "Yeah, you want to go to council with me?" <laughs> you know, senior in college, yeah, I'll, I'll go to council. So we get down to the airport. They they don't have our SUV that we're supposed to get around. There's a lot of driving, and Greg, they're just pulled in a, a bright yellow Mustang, you know, two two door Mustang. Greg goes, "What about that one?" <laughs> and they're like, "It's not clean, but you can have it." He's like, "We'll take it." Well, of course, as the intern, anytime there were more than two people in the car, I have to squeeze in the back and, and Greg inviting everyone, hey, you want to ride in the Mustang? And every time I'm squeezing <laughs> in the back. And, uh, but he was loving it, you know, riding with the window down, his arm out. But, um, you know, so, so the infamous Stephen Wedgworth was Greg asked Stephen, you know, in the course of ordination exam, you know, are, are the Psalms important? And uh, you know, Stephen had a great answer. Yes, they're important. They're good for counseling. They're good for personal worship. We need to be using them in worship. We should be singing them. Um, you know, th they, they speak of Christ. They're the song of Christ. Um, and so, yeah, like the Psalms are really important. Well, so then Greg's, you know, twist the screw a little harder. All right, that's a good answer. Uh, start at one and just give me one sentence for each of the Psalms. So short description of each of the Psalms. And I think Stephen said he got to three and couldn't go any further. And then Greg had him start at 150 and work backward. I think he said he got to 148. Um, you know, it's so a great point was, you know, it's good to, you know, we can have theology in our mind yeah. and not have scripture in our mind. And so Greg, you know, would always, you know, because I had probably another six, seven years before my own ordination exam. And so Greg would always kind of tease that question to me. And one time I was just, you know, you know what, Greg, I want to hear you do it. And I threw seven just random Psalm numbers at him. 
and Greg nailed every single one of them. Wow. wow. You know, like it was, and I'm not talking, you know, Psalm 51, like, you know, one yeah. that I had no idea. Hey, yeah. Greg, what's Psalm 138 about? And he'd be right. like, and he'd tell you. And, yeah. you know, I said, well, how do you know that? And he's like, well, he's like, I've, I've recorded a lot of the songs, you know, written my kind of own metrical version. And um, so I have a song, you know, either we sing a song in worship or I have my own for most of the Psalms. And so Greg, you know, could do what he asked others to do, which was, um, yeah, that, that always impressed me. Um, the other story that I thought about, and it's a short one, is uh, my first son was born on Easter Sunday. And uh, so we, we did not make church that day. We we're in the hospital. And uh, about five o'clock, we had a knock on the door. And Greg walks in where, in a shorts and a polo shirt with a couple Ziploc bags of smoked meat. <laughs> <laughs> smoked salmon. He just come, you know, he stayed for about 10 minutes and dropped off the smoked meat and left. And uh, it was just wonderful. You know, it, and looking back on it, such a Greg Strawbridge moment of ministry, you know. So there's a couple stories. That's fantastic, Jared. It really is amazing, though, with um, with Joy's uh, eulogy at, at the memorial service, that concept of table and water, this kind of keeps coming back, you know, this sense that he is the guy who is going to prepare a table for you in the presence of our enemies. And hmm. you know, we're not we're not this is not a sort of a military environment in some ways. But at the same time, he's saying, look, in the midst of all this turmoil, you're going through your life, a new baby or whatever. Here's food for you to find refreshment. That um, that theme seems to come up again and again as we talk about uh, about our friend Greg Strawbridge. Go ahead, Mike. You're always the, you're the pugilist in the, the gang. You're always picking <laughs> fights with uh, sovereign grace advocates. <clears throat> no, no, no. See, I, I my my memory is horrible. I I actually didn't even when Jerry was telling that story, I didn't even think I was there. I'm like, Oh, I must not been there. But then as soon as, but then as soon as Jared said, Oh, he was talking about me. I'm like, Oh, that's right. I remember sitting around the table in Greg's uh, dining room talking to these guys. Um, but I, you know, I can't remember any of the content and I don't think, I don't think I, I, I fought. I think I probably poked, uh, you know, a little bit, but I remember one time Greg and I went to, uh, meet up with these people they were the Hebrew, these the hebrew roots uh of folks and him and i went and and we were talking to these people and and they you know showed us some video and and they were trying to get us to you know well i guess become you know hebrew roots christians or whatever and 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 and, and greg greg was real real i mean greg was always so patient and kind with people and me, I'm like, you know, being the pugilist, I'm like breaking out my Jim Jordan, you know, two by four. I'm ready to take these guys to task. And, you know, and I'm like, look, you don't even understand your Bible. And, and, and Greg's just like, Mike, <laughs> like, like, calm down, man. Like, this is not this is not going to work. I'm like, no, hold on, Greg. Like, I got a point I got to make here. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and Greg's like, we're, you know, and, and we're, he was just so he was always just so kind. Um, even, you know, some people. Some people, you know, like me, you know, we, <laughs> so some people like me, uh, we're very upfront and in your face and vocal and just bold and, and, but Greg, Greg was not that way. I don't, I don't think, I, don't, I wouldn't say he was, he was to shy away from a fight or anything like that, but he was just way more willing to um, be gracious and kind to people and to, uh, well, in love, just kind of assume the best about people. And, and, and whenever there was a disagreement and he kind of knew right, right away, like, well, there's not going to be, you know, we're at an impasse and we're not going to be able to, you know, get past this. He would just kind of do this thing where he would say, well, I guess we'll just have to move on or whatever. But there's always this, he always tilted his head to the side and he would lift up his hand. He'd say, well, <laughs> and it was like a classic, classic Greg Strawbridge move. I could just remember seeing that, that motion and, and 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 just gesture uh a, a million times well you know and and just kind of just move just let's just move on yeah. and and it, it could be it could be about a number of things he was just so uh 
he did not he did not even even in the midst of disagreement he did not want to disrupt the 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 unity of the spirit and the bond of peace and so uh he he really lived that out well mm. that's fantastic and i think jared talked about this in his eulogy about the ironic nature of greg strawbridge <clears throat> and um there was there wasn't an environment where he wanted to steal the scene from anybody you know back in that in that 2008 in conroe texas jared i was i was there i don't know if we met but those were my my early days i was still applying for a pastoral position and um there was a big i don't know if greg was the pm of council in those days but we were much smaller the pm of augustine presbytery augustine okay Okay, well, there was a, a brouhaha between he and uh, R.C. Sproul Jr. <laughs> and uh, uh, Greg just was so uh, intense that day. And so was R.C., as you can imagine. But um, he was just very eager. I think it was over the conversation over Confederation. We were in those, in those early days, we were considering changing to uh, uh, abandoning Confederation. And R.C. Jr., of course, was in favor. We got to uphold this principle here. And Greg was just asking some really pertinent questions that were very pastoral and about how to best shepherd this denomination in our, in our youth. And um, it was really evident that he had a heart that um, was, was caring and shepherding. And afterwards, I went to him and I said, man, I've um, been following your work for some time. And I want to thank you for that interaction. And he said, um, hey, you think I was too, I mean, it was, he treated me as if he's known me for 10 years now. Hey, you think I was a little too harsh with RC? <laughs> and I was a 28 year old kid just that graduated from RTS. And I said, no, I think you did great. You held your ground, but you weren't uh, forceful. And um, that's just kind of the, the human being that he was. Hey, Benjamin, why don't you uh, share a story or two, brother? Um, okay, I, I thought of uh, a few. The, the one that I shared. I got to share this with him, uh, I guess a month or two ago, and and some of the guys that I had a very difficult funeral to do here uh, this past year, and kind of um, <clears throat> wasn't folks that folks folks that I knew, but but I wasn't planning to do the funeral. We, we was initially planning to take place in another. A church and other ministers and then halfway through the week that didn't work out and so I was called and I was scrambling trying to get everything ready and I um I didn't I just wasn't sure it was a very tragic sad funeral and I wasn't sure what what to do kind of at the last minute and the, you know kind of was one of those the day before I thought I remembered um, the, one, the family, the family had deep roots in, in reformed theology and presuppositional apologetics. And, um, and I remembered, oh, uh, I kept, I kept going back to the, uh, first question of the Heidelberg catechism. And I remembered hearing a story about Cornelius Van Til, uh, when, when his son was killed in, a, a car accident that Cornelius Van Til was told and he began to quote the Heidelberg Catechism in Dutch that he had learned as a young man, you know, immediately that was how he, you know, encouraged his spirit and responded faithfully to the news that his son had, had been taken in this way. And I thought, man, that, that right there is what I need to say in my funeral homily. That will that will register with these people and comfort these people. Um, <laughs> I couldn't for the life of me remember where did I hear this. So I was thinking, boy, I don't want to. I don't want it to be one of those you know kind of Protestant apocryphal stories that we do. <laughs> I got to get my. I got to make sure to get this right. I thought I, re I remember. Uh, I remember hearing it. And so I started, which is the worst way to research something, right? I started scouring audio files on my computer, like going back to, was it a sermon that I heard on the Heidelberg Catechism? And, and I'm trying to remember who, and of course, it ended up being, it was Greg Strawbridge. It was a sermon, 
or, or probably a teaching, maybe a Sunday school class that Greg had given on the Heidelberg Catechism or, you know, some history of the Reformation. And, you know, after, after a couple hours uh, of trying to find this and finish this homily, uh, I th it just dawned on me, oh, that was, that was Greg. And I found the audio file and listened to it. And uh, one of, uh, basically the man who, who was an elder at a church up in Lancaster where Cornelius Van Til was in that area where he was toward the end of his life, this was a friend of Greg's. So the actual elder who had to deliver the news to Cornelius Van Til about his son and who witnessed this personally, um, he was a friend of Greg. So he, um, that, that was just a, a very special, I don't, that may be kind of shop talk that that's kind of one of those like panic moments for a pastor. Like, what am I going to say tomorrow at this, at this funeral to these people? That was just one of those beautiful, uh, it was like a, the kind of gift that, that the ministry of Greg it through all, uh, not just through all saints, but through the, the ongoing ministry of Word MP3, um, just it's so that in and of itself is a treasure trove for me of encouragement and of resources. I know it's been to a lot of folks. I guess the other, the other story that comes to mind is um, the boat. I have a lot of fun, like all of us, I have a lot of funny stories about his boat. Um, that tie in in a lot of ways the the boat that he that he purchased <laughs> was so excited about and it was putting it mildly it was a bit of a fixer-upper <laughs> and uh you know when, when you're talking about a when you talk about a house that's a bit of a bit of a fixer-upper which is kind of my scenario of life right now but a boat is like a house floating on top of water that's even worse right so the, the ministerial training that Greg provided us usually took place on Fridays. We would drive over and, and do things Fridays and we'd have readings that we would do and discussions. And um, as, soon as, he, as soon as the boat entered the picture, it stopped being, hey, drive over to my house and my study. It became, hey, uh, how about we meet at the marina? Or how about we meet at the, and I don't even remember the name of the place where it's like a boneyard for boats and it's a giant, it's a parking lot that's too ratty to park cars on. So they put boats up on these stilt jack things <laughs> and Greg's, Greg's boat was on there. So I, we spent many, um, many times, many hours talking about theology, learning and um, uh, the, the classic for me, the, the classic, <clears throat> there was a, uh, the, I, I, I don't know about boats. I still don't know. I ought to know, but I don't know about boats. I enjoy going sailing, but so Greg, Greg says, do you do you, one day, do you know what, do you know what a bilge is? Oh, man, I, I don't know what a bilge is. He's like, but that, uh, come, come on, come here, come here. You know, like <laughs> Mike said, there are certain things that you can always imagine greg doing you know kind of like well you know that's yeah. one of them and then come here come yeah. here and you just know oh no so greg says you know you're you're just the right size i mean i'm too big to get down there to do this job but you are you are perfect for this so that you think your hand would reach down in there because my bilge pump is broken and I need to clear the bilge. And so the bilge is basically, you know, the kinds, I'll just put it this way, the kinds of things that roll downhill, whatever that might be. On a boat, it's even worse. And so the bilge is the area of the bottom of the boat that collects any such things that roll downhill on a <laughs> boat. <laughs> and there's a pump that's supposed to pump all that filth out. Well, the pump was broken, and so uh, I, I had the the, the uh, privilege of learning theology while using my arms to to scoop out the bilge <laughs> at the bottom of this boat. 
And um, Ben, is there any more apt so, metaphor? Is there any more apt metaphor for pastoral ministry sometimes? <laughs> and, and this is what Greg said. This is what Greg said. And so I, actually, it's interesting. The last text that I have from Greg, is so funny. So this was an ongoing conversation that we, we would joke about. Let me see here. And the last text that I have from him was uh we are we are talking about a sermon i was getting ready to do a sermon john actually john too a passage that he loved very well i think it was the first passage i ever preached at all saints filling in for him you know the wedding at cana and uh, the cleansing of the temple and and so i'm getting ready studying that and um uh john chapter two the language is very vivid and you know jesus tells the servants after they have filled the six stone pots all the way up with water to the very brim he uses a colorful john uses a colorful word that jesus tells them to scoop down into these pots and draw up and then take it to the master of the feast and see what he says and a lot of times we use, you know, the, uh, the picture is either drawing from a well, so lowering something way down, or the outline of biblical usage says, uh, anteleo means to go down into the hold of a ship to bail up properly bilge water. Ah. So I sent Greg <laughs> a screenshot of that, and I said, uh, this is from the Greek studying for my sermon, John 2. Good memories, smiley face. <laughs> and he says, yes, see how vivid real life makes it. <laughs> so we got a lot of a lot of mileage out of that. The, uh, the last time I ever talked to Greg, um, Saturday before he died, he had a story about his current ministerial student trying to move a big TV into the church that they bought from Costco so that he could do his PowerPoint slides. Yeah. And it was a cold day and apparently, you know, it was like 20 degrees and Greg had to leave. Right? Greg's like, I got a meeting. Can you, and then the TV was broken. They need to return it and bring it back. So, you know, the current ministerial student spent all afternoon, you know, moving this huge television. But Greg, he's like, I told him it could be worse. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other funny story there is that, that uh, he buys this boat, you know, this fixer upper kind of a reclaimed boat. And the, the, the title on the back of it, you guys remember the name, the title is painted across the name of the vessel is painted across the back and it's called the sundowner. And so we had all these jokes about like the Debbie Downer and the Sun Downer and why would you buy a boat called that? And we started talking like, what, what does that mean? And uh, Greg's like, I don't know, but you know, once I get this thing finally fixed up to where I want it, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to rename it the Sun Riser, you know, uh -huh. or something like that. <laughs> and uh, years later, was reading with my kids. We went on a, on a, on a binge of reading Roald Dahl books. And so uh, for better, for worse, read through all of these Roald Dahl books with my kids. And on, in Boy, which is Roald Dahl's recollecting his childhood, quirky childhood memories, he, he uses this term, uh, sundowner. And I'm reading to my kids and it's just, I mean, this is years later. And I just shocked, like, wait, sundowner, hate it. And, and apparently, so it's, it's, it's a British term for uh, the alcoholic drink that you have at sundown, but that's not, not technically your nightcap, that yeah. comes later. Yeah. So the sundowner is kind of like drinks at sundown. And I thought, oh. that's, really, that's really appropriate. Greg is, not, Greg is not going to change the name of his boat now. This is, <laughs> this is <good. laughs> So, so that is um, that's an interesting sort of segue into the, uh, the the legacy of Greg. And there's so many things that are attached to his name, his persona. Um, but one of the things I think we all have gained from tremendously was the the vast sort of theological legacy that he left us. And theological in the more academic terms, and we'll talk about the pastoral dimension of it later. later. But the two issues that keep coming up, and that was 
you know, amidst of all of our, our, Greg was my sort of pastoral confidant. We shared secrets with one another. We shared um, pastoral struggles. And I think every pastor needs another pastor in their lives to talk about certain things that are just um, not the kinds of things you share with, uh, with the laity, those whom you, you shepherd. Greg was that man for me. But the two theological issues that just keep coming back, and I'd love to get your, your thoughts, uh, John, beginning with you, was, was post-millennialism and, and covenant baptism, pedo baptism uh, In your estimation, we'll start with John. Why did, the, why did these two theological categories capture and embody Greg Strawbridge in, in such heightened state? Yeah, um, well, I think it was surrounding a discussion of post-millennialism that I first even heard the name Greg Strawbridge, um, and that was at an ETS conference in Philadelphia. He was presenting a paper on 1 Corinthians 15, yeah. um, and, you know, that, that, was a, that was a really kind of important part of my, I was in Bible college, I hadn't even gone to All Saints yet, um, but I'll share one, one anecdote, the other guys probably know this, but I think this to me, sort of defines how post-millennialism uh, just kind of shot through everything that that Greg did. He was very he was very fond of saying, you know, someone would come to him and say, "Well, how can you be post-millennial? Isn't the world just getting worse and worse and worse, and things are going downhill really fast?" And he would say, "Oh, oh okay. So, so you think things are getting worse and worse? You think the world is getting worse? Well, let me prove post-millennialism to you right now." this is an iPhone. <laughs> and, you know, with all the caveats, of course, that there's, as the Amish could tell us, that there's downfalls to phones and there's all sorts of other things that we should be aware of. Uh, but he was, he was, uh, you know, he was very willing to see everything in the world through the lens of uh, the, the hopefulness, the goodness um, of, of what God was doing in history. Um, you know, looking at the, the promises of the Psalms, Psalm 2 and 110 were always a big part of the stuff that he would discuss and talk about. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not sure his, his uh, you know, his kind of development and, and how he landed there, but that's certainly how it, how it worked out for those of us that came after, I think. Uh, and related to baptism, I was also thinking about an, another kind of short clip of things that he would often say um, he was fond of saying at baptisms uh, reminding us that even though he was you know he was baptizing a baby most Sundays um, he was very fond of saying every baptism is an infant baptism and reminding us all that that the childlike faith uh, uh, you know that we were seeing embodied in the little baby being baptized was what we were all called to do um, so everything, even, even those two very important, very heady, deep topics that he was so, so good with, he was also very, um, it was very important to him that that be seen at the, at the pastoral, regular, you know, real life level. Um, that was always really meaningful to me. Jared. Yeah, um, I think, you know, Post-millennialism is what drove Greg's um, hopefulness and joyful attitude. Um, you know, when I was in seminary, I was surrounded by amillennialists, and one of my professors said, the Reformed faith has always just maintained that life sucks, then you die, <laughs> but there is resurrection, Yeah. Um, which is <clears throat> in some part true, but Greg would say, no, there's also resurrection now. Mm. Right? We're not just, it's not just a whole bunch of not yet you know, the resurrection that Christ gives us, but there is a big slice of already. Um, mm -hmm. And Greg loved to dwell in the already, uh, mm -hmm. of the already not yet um, tension. Um, you know, this world is good. God created it good and he is redeeming it. And um, it just, you know, it just came out in every single thing that he did. Um, and just that joyful attitude and um, that, mm -hmm. God is redeeming the world now. It's not just something that we're waiting for. Uh, we're not just waiting for the end point where all God's enemies will be subdued. But God, Christ is doing that currently. He's doing that now. And so therefore, go out as a joyful warrior uh, in 
in in that mission uh, for Christ. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I think, you know, the pedo baptism just came out in his in his full inclusionness of everyone. We've kind of talked about that before where Greg was just warm and, and wanted to, you know, just include everyone into the body life, including the youngest of children. You know, mm -hmm. Greg had no bone in the body that wanted to exclude people um, from church life. Um, and so we just really embraced that uh, infant inclusion vision um, where, hey, they are in the body and in, in, in the church and they are full members and they are part of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and just, um, yeah, part of our mission of what the church is supposed to do. Yeah, that's great. Mike or Ben? Yeah, um, that, that paper that John mentioned that Greg wrote for the ETS uh, on 1 Corinthians 15, uh, that, that was a paper that, um, this is before I even knew really who Greg was, but it was that paper that, that, that made me, that was like the final nail in the coffin uh, to convince me of post-millennialism. Um, yeah, so uh, the, it, it, it's interesting uh, that, that these two topics that we talk about, uh, baptism and, 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 and post-millennialism, so these, the, these, in effect, these were the last things that he taught about. The, his, his last sermon that he preached was on baptism. And that Sunday, he also taught Sunday school, and it was his last lesson that he was teaching on postmillennialism. Um, and uh, and so it, it really in, it really was just it encompassed his whole ministry. Um, and and even if it's not even if it's not baptism, but sacraments in general, um, you know, just seeing kind of what Jared Jared was talking about that this uh, the ordinary the ordinary things of life that God has given to us are the, are the, the truly the means of grace whereby we receive, where, whereby we truly receive God and, and Christ and the kingdom of heaven by faith. And so I think that's why, you know, food was also just such a major part in Greg's um, life and, and ministry, because these these were just good gifts from God that he gave to his people, ordinary everyday things that we are so quick to just look over water, bread, wine. These things testify to a deep hope that we have that all things will be made new and that and are made new in Christ. And so he just he just cherished them and he relished them and 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 he wanted to bring everybody into the fullness of of experiencing these blessings. Um, I, and it, I cannot tell you the impact that that simple ministry has had in my life. It, it is so profound. I, 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 I desire to bring this everywhere that I go um, in, in everything that I do. And I, I do it very poorly. Um, <laughs> I, do, I don't do it nearly as well as Greg does, uh, but, but it is at least a, a deep desire that I have um, and, and I think that our, our, our churches would, would be better and our, and our saints would be happier and, we're, and would be filled with more hope and more love if, if these things were at the front and center of, of our pastoral ministry. Yeah. I, I think of, um, especially my background, getting to know Greg, I was a Reformed Baptist. And so kind of a Calvinistic, maybe soteriology, Baptist, very, you know, very common category nowadays, which is great to see. I remember being sitting on the floor of my basement in Maryland on the phone call with Greg. We were talking about he had already agreed to take me, myself, and these two other guys under his wing to sponsor, their church would help sponsor a church plant work with us not, you know, with us still being ambivalent or kind of studying through baptism. Teach, we were all teachable, but we were unconvinced of, of uh, pedo-baptism. And I'm sitting there, Indian style, on the floor of my basement, on the phone, and Greg says, 
Uh, all right, all right, Russell. Look, what, what is your holdup with baptism? I mean, come on, man. And I said, it's really this. It's, it's, this, it's the typical hangup that you have coming, coming from a Baptist standpoint. It's, it's the Bible. I, I need to see it in the Bible. I don't, I don't feel like I see it there. And Greg's like, okay, all right. Let's deal with this once and for all. I want you to do something right now. Hold up your hands and nine fingers. <laughs> and he's like, I, we're not going anywhere until you assure me you are holding up nine fingers right now over the phone. Okay, I'm holding up nine fingers. And he says, all right, we're going to talk about every one of the nine examples of the people who we have named in scripture in the New Testament who were baptized. All right, we're going to do this right now. And so, you know, off the top of my head, you know, we're going through and it's, you know, Lydia, Cornelius, the Philippian jailer. It's Paul, Saul, Paul. Uh, who else am I forgetting? The Ethiopian eunuch, Simon the sorcerer, Gaius, Stephanus, and Crispus. And I think I, that, there you go. I think I got all of them, all nine by name. And he just worked down through. Okay, with these converts, how many of them are we told straight up were baptized with their households? And when you work through the list, and I, I mean, he's literally like, oh, no, 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 on the phone. How many fingers are you holding up? <laughs> I'm sitting there across like it on the floor of my basement, you know, holding my phone on my shoulder and, and going down through my fingers and go, well, okay, why didn't Paul, why wasn't Paul baptized with his house? Okay, I know he didn't have a house. Okay. His favorite one, of course, was the Ethiopian eunuch. Okay, now you tell me. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. The, the, so this, really, it turns out that basically the only one that's in question is Simon the sorcerer. And he loved to pick about that one too. Like, okay, I don't, do, how does this work with sorcerers? Do sorcerers go home at night and like, honey, I'm home. How was your day? A lot of great sorcerer, sorcering or whatever. You know? <laughs> he, he's like, we, we probably don't have a robust household for a dude named Simon the sorcerer. Okay, everybody else was baptized with their household. Russell, what's your point? Here's the scripture. Here's, let's just look at the numbers in scripture. So there's, that was the moment for me that the light bulb turned on. And, and some of that is more of a subtle change of getting to see it in the context instead of, you know, I always do this today, but don't, don't debate infant baptism. It, debate household baptism this this is what actually is in scripture and that night the shift was just so natural oh it yeah it is in scripture i see it it's in fact it's the norm it's the new testament pattern um and he was very pastoral he was very kind he was so patient and then finally kind of recognize that i was at the point where it's like okay you you're ready to make a decision about this i mean so i i'll never forget that and he brings that up i think he he brought that up in the final sermon that he preached which as mike was talking about those are fantastic lessons so listen to the series that he did on eschatology and listen to the series these are free on wordmp3.com and listen to his final sermon on baptism it was very fitting providentially very fitting sermon like a magnum opus kind of a sermon yeah. that he preached uh, in what he had no idea would be his final sermon. Mm. It's worth mentioning, if I may, Ben, that that final sermon, um, I won't name names, but I've been told by people there uh, actually convinced some people of, of covenant baptism as well. So it's huh. not just that it was a great sermon. It actually, uh, even in that, that final week, had changed some minds and hearts. So. Yeah, and we were we were talking prior about uh, some of the, the private uh, emails that I've received and notes I've received on uh, Twitter and via email about uh, certain families who say, "Hey, so tell me more about this baptism issue." And um, uh, and it was interesting before you know a few days before Greg died, um, I called him on Saturday, called him on Monday, and on Tuesday, which was the day before he died, and our conversation had to do with, and I think he mentioned this in his last sermon. Uh, had to do with a, a debate that James White uh, that uh, Greg did with James James White that you know I think 2015 or 16 that uh, Jim had called me or emailed me I can't remember and said hey I'm going to your alma mater Reform Seminary in Orlando 
I'm doing a debate on Islam, but the next day I'm trying to set up a debate on Baptist, and your name was recommended to have this discussion, this debate with me. And uh, I said, let me think about it. And uh, as soon as I got off the phone, I said, there's just no way this is going to happen. Um, this guy, this guy <laughs> does it for a living. He is, uh, he's known as the kind of guy who just gets in your face. And I would have to take a three month sabbatical just to make sure I was well prepared. But I said, I have a friend that I can call and I called Greg and within 20 seconds of the conversation, he goes, Hey, I'll be glad to do it. I'll be happy to do it. And, uh, we at Kyperion ended up publishing the little booklet that was uh, put on the table and display there at the debate and we sold lots and lots of copies there. He came to our church that weekend, preached for me and did a Sunday school on what he was gonna talk about at the debate. And I didn't go and I honestly didn't watch the debate until, until last week, until a couple of weeks ago, which is why it precipitated my call with him. I was coming back from a board meeting at Theopolis in Birmingham and I said, I gotta call Greg. This was a fabulous debate. The, the one thing I remember, and this, this kind of fits into the way we're, we're talking about, the way Greg thinks and thought about theology, was that he kind of began that debate with James White in Orlando by building a, a biblical theology of water from the Old Testament. And that is such a foreign concept when it comes to these debates on baptism. I think Benjamin may have mentioned, you know, the idea is you want to sort of prove text your way through the Bible. Well, so we don't talk about that at the Trinity. We don't talk about that when it comes to the participation of women in the Lord's Supper, which the New Testament says zero about. But when it comes to baptism, we want to say, well, give me a proof text. And what Greg was doing was sort of building this beautiful theology of water from the Old Testament and making the case. And it was just completely, it just didn't harmonize with what the expectations that people had until six to a year later. But he said, these folks were calling me and say, man, that those initial observations about the theology of water in the Old Testament, about the crossing of the Red Sea, about the flood about all these, and now they begin to sort of harmonize in my mind. And I think what Greg did in some ways was he very cautiously, without the bravado of guys like Jim White, for example, cautiously with a load of, you know, eunuch humor. And he would just, pull, he would just plant these little seeds. He called it the eunuch factor in the debate. He would plant these little seeds and they had this, you know, this just attractive feature. And as people who heard it, when that stuff was planted into their hearts, it was, we knew that eventually there was going to bear fruit. They would say, wait a minute, you know, why are children again, not involved in, uh, if, if, if God made this glorious covenant with you and your children, in the old Testament, why would a greater covenant exclude children rather than incorporate them even more so? And, uh, that was just the, the legacy of a guy like, um, like Greg, who's sort of, um, came at you in a very subtle fashion, didn't come with the, the kinds of sophistication that you've seen professional debater, but he just laid the roots. And that was so endearing um, about our brother. A couple more things here and we'll, we'll finish our time. Uh, on modeling pastoral theology and training, I wonder if you guys could talk a little bit about how, uh, maybe an example or two of how some of these Training sessions happen. Jared mentioned in his eulogy that, you know, whatever expectations we had that this was a, a serious sort of academic environment, and it may have been at times, but um, the best pastors I know are the kinds of guys who draw people to you rather than keep it at arm's length and say, you know, go read Bavink chapter three, go read Burkhoff. Um, give me some examples, uh, John, I'll start with you of just kind of how some of this stuff fleshed out when you were under Greg in preparation for ministry? <clears throat> yeah, I don't know that I have any really flowery stories to tell on this particular topic, but, but it was, you know, some of the things that we're talking about now, it, it was just a, it was a lived embodied thing. Uh, there weren't just the sort of like kill shot argument winners that he would dump on you with any kind of pastoral issue. It was just, uh, seeing it lived out, seeing it done. So, I mean, we had, you know, my wife and I had, had different things that we were, would struggle with early in our marriage with maybe uh, difficulties with other people or, or, you know, different things that were happening just in the life of the church. And he was always more than, more than willing to have us over and sit around the, the kitchen table with Sharon, his wife, and, and just discuss it. You know, we, we had, you know, friends that were going through 
um, you know, a difficult circumstance and we were trying to help them and had no idea what we were doing. And, and he was, he was like, you know, we'll just come over and have dinner and let's talk about it. Um, and again, it wasn't like, uh, here are your three steps to fix your friend's problem. It was, it was listening and talking and, um, you know, just kind of living through the, the issue with the person that, that was really important, I think. Um, and sort of like, I, I forget who mentioned it earlier, but, um, you know, the, the kind of open humbleness, I remember being at a debate he did with a, a Church of God guy on, uh, on uh, original sin, I believe it was, way back. And there was a break in the middle of it. And I went up to him and he said, how am I doing? What, anything I should do differently? I'm like, dude, you're the professional here. I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, but, but that was, that was the kind of openness to, to talk about um, whatever was going on that, that I think was modeling that, that pastoral heart. It wasn't ever a, you know, I'm sitting up here and you're down here and you're just lucky to be in my presence. It was, we're, we're here and we're talking as Christian brothers and um, you know, we're going to, we're going to do this life thing together as, as Christians. And I, so it wasn't a curriculum, like Jared said, it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a, you know, a really rigorous academic discipline. We were doing seminary at other places at the time and uh, had that going on on the side. It was just seeing how, seeing how life, uh, was supposed to be lived um, under the lordship of Christ in all things. Go ahead, Jared. You're muted. Very vivid memory for me is uh, soon after I um, started interning with Greg, um, a lady in the church, very young lady, young mother, um, found out she had terminal cancer. And uh, Greg said, well, you're my intern now, and this is what we do. So, you know, I was, I was terrified, you know, I'm going to go into this house and, you know, and these people just got life shattering news and what am I going to do? You know, I'm, well, I know I'm just going to sit there and be quiet, but, you know, I, I remember walking into their house and um, Greg was, you know, just sat and listened and, and, you know, just kind of allow them to process through their, their emotions, the husband and wife. And then uh, I remember um, he opened up Psalm 46, you know, God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore I will not fear and just, you know, walk through hope in Christ and um, not fearing in times of trouble and um, a hopefulness, even in the midst of these uh, hard times. Um, you know, the other thing, I mean, you've talked about it, Yuri, but, you know, Greg continued to be our pastor, you know, I mean, people are, you know, Greg's still my pastor, right? I mean, he never stopped being my pastor. Um, and, you know, just, just two weeks ago, the week he died, um, a friend of mine had a guy who was restored to the table that Sunday, rather than face full communication because of Greg's advice. You know, they kind of wanted to clamp down on this guy and, and, you know, kind of go heavy handed. And Greg said, no, you know, give the guy a little bit of time, work with him and uh, censor him, but don't, don't go full bore communication, be kind and gracious and, you know, see if you can win him back. And I think it was, the, I think it was the Sunday before he died. It might've been the Sunday after he was restored to the Lord's table rather than <clears throat> face that full communication. You know, so that's just Greg's, you know, kind of patient, um, walking with people, trying to give them space. You know, I think Greg was, was very convinced that you can never change somebody else's mind. You know, you can listen, you can give them the space to process, um, and you can urge them with the truth and urge them with the hope of the gospel, but you can't force them to accept it. Um, and so the only thing you can do is be patient and share the gospel hope um but you can't force people yeah yeah um in the the topic of greg bringing people into 
uh, the pastoral ministry and having you at the equal level. Uh, I have a, a similar experience. I don't, I don't know, John and Jared, if you were if you were with me. Remember when we went to PBU, and uh, and we had it was like it was like the, an an evening of eschatology sort of thing, and it was it was Greg and Vern Poitras and John Masters and some other guy, Frankie. I think he was like the uh, the, the 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 biblical theological seminary guy in Hatfield. I think so. Yeah, John. <laughs> yeah. 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 That. That guy had like no idea what he was even doing up there. He's like, I don't even know what I'm doing here. <laughs> but uh, before before we before it started, Greg Greg turns to me and he says, Mike, how do you think I should start? How should I begin my my talk? And and again, I was I was I'm like, what are you talking? What are you asking me for? You are the guy. And I said, well, Greg, uh, you should just go and begin with the Great Commission. And he's like, you're right. You're absolutely right, and uh, and so that's that's where he he began his talk. Uh, um, yeah, he would just uh, whatever the event was, whether it was a uh, he he'd always try to combine things together when when he, he we may have a, a a conference or something, or or he would invite a guest a guest speaker. So I I can remember at least two times. Maybe you guys remember more, but I remember one time. He brought Troy Green down from down from where is he at Brooklyn, New York. He brought yeah, yeah. Troy, yeah, he brought Troy Green down from Brooklyn, and 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 after our our men's breakfast, where he would have he would have the guy speak to all the men in the church during the men's breakfast, and then afterwards we'd go into the upper room at uh, at Oregon Dairy, where we would have uh, our ministerial sessions, and he would have. You know, Troy Green would talk to us about theology, and I remember he did the same thing with old Mickey Schneider. Um, Mickey would Mickey came and uh, and 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 would tell us uh, all sorts of wonderful things. And uh, it was there, it was there that I remember Mickey Mickey saying um, that he 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 regretted that one time um, somebody asked Mickey's son. He says. Mickey, or, uh, you know, I forget what his son's name is, but he says, do you want to be a pastor like your dad? And the son said, no, I, I want to spend time with my family. Mm. And, 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 and Mickey just like, he was crushed by it. You know, he, he realized that the demands of pastoral ministry in, 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 in a pastor's life and the demands that it puts upon a family, it could, it could easily break a family. And so Greg was, um very kind to bring that out uh to us to let us know you know you need to like jesus you need to count the cost you need to understand the demands of pastoral ministry and what god's asking you to do um mm -hmm. and you need to be able to balance these things in a way that is going to be life-giving to your family um and so you know you could you should never sacrifice your family on the altar of ministry i remember him saying something like that um and then i remember another time where we had a phone conversation with uh was it uh stephen wedgworth i think and there was a debate about uh, uh jared I, I i forget it now but it was a debate about something maybe you guys can help me out remember that but natural i remember it was law. what was it natural law natural law that's yeah. right that, yeah. that's right because jim jordan was all <laughs> Jim is all against natural law and yep. and uh and Stephen Wedgworth is all for it and yeah that's right because they I I think they like they were talking about each other I think and so we we got to experience some of that but of course John her and I had the best experience together where Greg brought us to his house and he made us mulch his yard uh that was that, that was true that, that was true uh pastoral internship uh stuff right there. I mean of course it doesn't go as, as far as uh you know cleaning out the bilge or anything there but uh but yeah that that was Greg um he just loved to just bring us into his life and uh uh, he he'll he'll be greatly missed. Yeah, indeed, brother Benjamin. Uh, the last time this, you know, the bringing it back to the uh, the glory of God and Greg's life. The last time that we spoke, the week before he died, on the phone, I called him up. We had some things to talk about, and um, it, uh, 
one of the things that I ask my it just providential. I, I don't know if you guys have had this experience, but when I kind of think back just the the month prior, you know, providentially, it was just a lot of kindnesses of God to to let us have certain conversations or kind of like the final sermon that he preached, the final mm -hmm. Sunday school that he preached. Uh, there are just so many wonderful little gifts. And uh, one of those was, you know, I recognize that, you know, for instance, the, those of us that were at the CREC council, the fact that we just a few months ago, all tried to get together, those of us who were there line up and take a picture with Greg. And we have that picture now. And that was, that was just That's such great. a kind providence. So the last time I talked to him, uh, I, don't, I don't remember why I brought this up, but I, I talked to him. I got a chance to, to ask him, to, to thank him for doing so much pastoral training. And this is probably a bit of a hyperbole, but I said, you know, you are, I don't know if what the numbers are, but it, it sure seems like you, you have churned out over the years as many CREC pastors or ministers, you know, reform ministers as, as, as uh, great friars. I mean, you, it's just like, it's remarkable to think of all the guys that funneled through Lancaster and you trained and are now in ministry. How did you do that? And he said, uh, well, <laughs> I, yeah, he said, listen, I, we at one point our session had a talk and we recognized this was happening and we formalized it we put it in the budget i put together a program it's funny as as as, as off the cuff and jazzy and improv improvisory that's a word as greg could be uh greg had a lick of administration in him too greg knew how to put together a spreadsheet um greg greg wasn't you know, lacking in, in gifts of administration. And uh, he said, I put this whole program together and the next year, zero happened. We had money to throw at it. I had a program and I, we were all ready, but formally it never took. And once that dwindled down in the providence of God, my phone started ringing and other guys started showing up. And we kicked it back off again, but it was never something he said. It was just never something we knew how to manufacture or formalize. It was all this kind work of God that I don't know, just happened. Um, so, I, you know, I praise God for that. Mm. And and the we did have a lot of I, I can remember reading on Christian doctrine by Augustine and having these long discussions with him. He did the same thing when we first showed up. He formalized a big reading list. We, we tested. So he, he had gave us a, an officer's exam and then he evaluated that. And um, he, he used that as kind of the, the springboard for, for looking, okay, you got, we got to shore up these areas of, of you know, knowledge for you and training. Uh, but then, yeah, I, rem I, I think several of you guys were there. We did, we did several times where we were moving rocks in his backyard. Do you remember? I never <laughs> did mulch, but I did these rocks when he was putting that thing in his backyard. Uh, so it was life, he, lots and lots of life, but joy. There was so much joy. Um, I mean, yeah, this is a testament. Like, how could you convince guys to come mulch your backyard it just it won't work unless there's this joy drawing you to continue on and do that so you know all praise to god and um it's this is a faithful minister yeah we i second what mike said he will he really will be missed and i know you guys feel that i mean i'm still trying to figure out we always say this at funerals and it's true to some degree you know he will be missed but greg is leaving this palpable void a practical void as you mm. said yuri he's so well he's a pastor's pastor i i really still i'm not quite sure okay next week i can't call greg who am i gonna call to help me think these think mm. through these issues pastorally mm. yeah well, let's, uh, I wanted to 
close our time, I think we may have covered this, but I'd just be curious to see, beginning of John, um, what is one element or theme of Greg's pastoral ministry that you see yourself sort of embodying and taking with you in your, in your pastoral work there in Chicago? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I, I, you know, I think maybe I would answer it more in the, in the vein of what I hope I would take with me. Um, <laughs> because I think all of us are feeling a, a pretty profound sense of uh, what, what we're lacking in what we saw in Greg, um, what we'd hope to emulate, but, but what we are pretty aware we're not as good at, 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 uh, as he was. Um, so I think, I think one of the things that I, that I hope that I can be taking with me is, is his ability and his willingness to, you know, drop whatever was going on when there was an issue that came up. Um, you know, you have a, you have a question, you call him and he's willing to talk for an hour or two, or, um, you know, I, I find myself sometimes just as a sort of a confession you know getting kind of stuck to my to my calendar and my routine I know I've got something coming up here and so it's hard to kind of draw pull myself away from from that thing that I know is coming up in a half hour uh, but regardless of what was going on I mean he would he'd be he'd be there and present and willing to to talk about it even if he was riding his motorcycle and had his earbuds up in his helmet he would answer the phone and and talk to you with wind flying through the right through the, the helmet. <laughs> um, so that, that just, that total willingness to be there and to, um, to be present regardless of what he had going on. I mean, uh, I'm sure he always had other many bigger pressing things going on, whether it was preparation for a debate or for his own sermons or his own lessons or whatever it was, he was, he was ready to go. Um, you know, I remember at uh, I think Ben mentioned Oregon Dairy. We would have our men's breakfast there on Saturdays. Uh, and then some of us ministerial students would talk in the, in the upper room. But there was this one Saturday. I mean, I'm thinking of my own ministry now. Saturday, I'm, I've got Sunday on my mind. But we were, we were leaving the upper room and uh, walked downstairs. And we were walking out the door. And he asked me about a class I was in in seminary at the time. And it was a philosophy class I was taking. And and he just like paused between the kind of the inner door and the outer door, that sort of like breezeway section where you might hang your coats. And he just like stopped right there and it was like, oh, philosophy. So, uh, you know, Schopenhauer thought this and, and just started like listing out all these philosophers. We ended up just like sitting on the bench in the middle of those two doors on a Saturday when I'm sure he had a million of other things to do uh, and just talk about what, what was going on in my class. So that that's the thing that I... I, I know that I'm woefully <laughs> underprepared for, but that I hope of his ministry that I can, can carry on the, the willingness to be there and to be present. Mm. Jared. Yeah, mine's uh, a lot of the same. Um, you know, I think Ben just talked about that picture of us and Greg, you know, soon after his death, someone said, you know, you guys are his legacy now. And someone said, well, those are big shoes to fill. And I said, well, actually it's a big, it's a big robe to fill. <laughs> and uh, I, think, I think that's how we all feel that, that, um, you know, following in, in his shoes is a, is a large task. Um, but yeah, when I think of Greg's pastoral ministry and leadership style, it's, you know, with never a top down, you know, I'm the, I'm the boss and, you guys are the underlings. It wasn't this, you know, I'm the important man uh, up front. You know, I mean, he truly tried to embody what the robe meant, you know, that I am, I am a minister, right? You know, my personality, who I am, is not as important as, you know, the fact that I am, you know, a minister uh, bringing God's grace, God's word to you. Um, but, it, you know, his, his ministry style, his leadership style was, you know, uh, like Levin, he was in the midst of the of the congregation, just changing it and and filling it with his joy and his love and his food and um, and you know just his faithful presence, just you know living um, you know 
living with his people and you know cooking with them and having them in his house and baptizing them it was just faithful day you know week after week day after day ministry in and among a particular people mm. um, which is you know again i i strive i don't know if i do that as well as he did but that is you know that's the the goal to <clears throat> attain to Yeah, I think uh, I I I have to. Yeah, <laughs> this is it, man. I, I I can't I can't say anything more than what these two guys have just said. Um, I too find myself stuck in the uh, of the the routine of the schedule. All right, what do I have to do? I got to make sure that I I'm always you know I always have something prepared. I'm always gonna make sure that I have my uh, you know, Wednesday evening service prepared, and I gotta have you know, my sermon prepared, and I'm always looking towards the, the teaching opportunities in, in my ministry as being the, uh, the main aspect of my ministry. My teaching is, is, is my main aspect of my ministry, and, uh, and, I, and I wish it weren't so. You know, I, I, I want to get to that point where being in the life of the lives of my people is the main aspect of my ministry. Not to say that, you know, teaching is not a part of that, but that I, 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 I just been so convicted at the, at the funeral, you know, after, after everybody talked, after, after Joy spoke and Jared, after you spoke and Yuri, after you preached and, and I, I just came away and I just, I, th I think I turned right next to you, uh, Jared. And I said, I just feel like a piece of crap. So I feel like I am the worst. I am the worst minister and person in the world. Greg was so good and his goodness just overflowed out of him. I mean, the, the phrase that I heard multiple times throughout the week, which is a, a phrase, of course, ascribed to Jesus was he does all things well. <laughs> he just does all things well. And, and he, Greg really did that and he, and he modeled that for us and he did it with just such great love. And, 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 you know, it, we all have our own little quirkiness about us. You know, we're all, we're all different. We're all special in our own special little way. <laughs> and, and, and Greg, Greg wasn't afraid to just, to just be Greg um, and to just be a friend and just to share a, a, a private laugh with you and, maybe even tell some inappropriate <laughs> jokes at times. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, he was just, he was just a guy who just loved, he was just a guy who just loved Jesus and the best way that he knew how to express the love of Jesus to you was just by living life together with you, bringing, bringing you in the middle of it and so i want to be able to do that better um and maybe maybe somewhere along the way uh learn how to cook a little bit better too uh <laughs> i do i haven't i have invested in a in a in a in a blackstone flat grill so uh uh on nice days i'll cook up some fajitas for my people you know or throw down some uh some some pancakes uh my for pastoral appreciation month um, my, my congregation bought me one of those new, uh, solo stoves, right? So it's like a, uh, it's a fire pit sort of thing, but it, it has this thing with air convection. I don't understand how it all works, but it's amazing. And it makes it kind of like a smokeless fire. And, and they bought me the, uh, attachment to it. So that way I could put it on top of it and it has like a grill on top of that. So I could, like, I could maybe even cook a pizza up on top of it. So I don't have the green, the big green egg. Greg, Greg loved his big green egg. I don't have the big green egg, but I do have a solo stove and I do have a flat top grill that I can, that I can utilize for the glory of God and to, and to feed my, and to feed my people. So I need to, I need to take those opportunities to uh, get up your game, man. You do that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Finish us off, Benjamin. Uh, that's great. I wish that I were more like Greg in a lot of ways. I remember taking that um, when, when I first got here, we have a men's prayer breakfast that meets at 6 a.m. every week, Tuesday morning. And I took the reins for that for several years. And we did a rotation with guys that would 
cook breakfast and each guy would take a turn. And at some point, you know, it was, it was flagging. And so I said, inspired by Greg, exactly like Mike is saying, I said, well, guys, what, why don't I just cook for everybody every week? And um, actually, Yuri, you know, Sam Nelson looked at me and he said, are you crazy? <laughs> Who do you think you are? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I, you know, I'm thinking I'm no Greg Strawbridge. That would be horrible. These, these guys would not come if I did that. Uh, I think of two things. I think mean, number one, that first, that first uh, back with that cooking contest in 2009, I still remember a conversation with Randy Booth and Greg Strawbridge and several other young guys in Greg's house and uh, asking for pastoral advice, just point blank. What, what's advice that you would give a young man as to how to be a, an effective pastor? And the, I, I remember there were a few things said, but the one thing that was said that was emphasized was, this is shop talk, but it was, as soon as you can, learn the names of every kid in your congregation. And, you know, that, that speaks to, the, we were talking about kind of the, the, the Pado faith angle and, and the inclusion of children in this covenant. And yeah, that, that, this great advice now it's something that i've been able to carry on mm. i would say that the thing that i hope to grow in is the that theme that all of us have touched on is is that ability like john was talking about who was it russ talked about that you know in the in the discipleship classes you talk about finding a fat guy faithful available teachable yeah and then uh you know the discipleship training that I got in was, and it was socially and emotionally mature. If you can find a guy like that, disciple him and how he had seen all those things in Greg and especially that availability. I just don't know following up on what Mike said. I just don't know how he did it. Uh, how was he that? That was why I know Greg Strawbridge. That's why I'm here today. That's why I cold called a guy who ran a web page that had how many tens of thousands of resources on it because another guy had cold called that guy and said, <laughs> you can get him on the phone. Like if you call this number, he will be the one to pick up and he'll talk to you. I cold called him and he talked to me for like two hours on the phone. Um, I, and that, that is not uncommon. That's just, I, I don't know if he had a cologne, if he had some sort of a sleep thing where he only had to sleep 30 minutes every day. How do you do that? I, I, this, no, I do think it was, it was this, it was that attitude again, you know, kind of what you could call it post-millennial, but it's faithful. He really did think, you know, the phone rings and the trap is for us pastors to kind of go, oh no, what, what now? Right? Like, oh, come on. I don't have time for this. I'm sure Greg and his humanity did that from time to time, but it, I never saw it. I never experienced it. You know, the phone would ring and Greg would, would faithfully, he'd pick up the phone thinking, I wonder what God is going to do here, <laughs> right? Like this, this, <laughs> seems, this seems like a providential open door. So God's about to do something with this. Um, and that led to availability and uh, it led to, know god so much gospel fruit yeah. so god grant that that's true of me and us that's wonderful you know i don't remember ever calling greg and leaving him a message because he always picked up the phone always did now on my end there were saturday mornings when i said oh it's greg strawbridge i don't think so <laughs> you know? i don't think so and uh one of the things that i in some ways regret at least i know under the providence of god is he invited me to speak at three separate occasions at a conference there in Lancaster. And I just for some reason couldn't make it happen. So um, real privilege to, to preach in his, um, the greatest conference that I've ever been a part of, which was last week in Lancaster and uh, preach and preside over his, his funeral. And that was a, a testament to how many lives he touched there. It's by far the biggest place I've ever preached at, and the biggest memorial service I've ever attended. And I was uh, really privileged to be with um all of you brothers there to shed tears and share stories and um, remember the legacy of a guy who 
has begun only for two weeks, but I suspect 20 years from now, we'll be even sharing the same and other stories about Reverend Dr. Greg Strawbridge. John Herr, Jared McNabb, Mike Shover, uh, Benjamin Russell, thanks for joining us, brother, this episode of Kyperian Commentary. Thank you very much, Yuri. Yeah, privileged. Thank you. Yeah, privileged, honored.